Okay, special time again, and as I said before, as a kid, I hadn't read this special when it first came out, which was pretty jarring when just reading the monthly comic, to see them just skip over a chunk of the story like that. The cover itself is awesome, showing a robotic Sonic and Knuckles fighting in the midground with several of the Freedom Fighters and Knuckles standing in the foreground, while Sally is opaque in the background against a wall of flame forming Robotnik's face. It's a great and striking visual, get you interested in wanting to see what's inside the comic regardless of whether you read the story leading up to it or not, and is beautifully composed. Seriously, it reminds me a lot of old sci-fi movie posters, I dig it. After a brief recap page, that even has the decency to refer to itself as a recap, we open on Sally finishing giving orders to Rotor and Antoine. Rotor runs off to go and grab something while Antoine stands by with an injured Knuckles in his arms. Sally has Nicole do a full sweep of the village, currently being destroyed by Mecha Sonic, so we're literally picking up right where the last issue left off. Don't worry though guys, the entire village was evacuated well in advance of the attack, so no need to worry about casualties here. Sally also laments that Sonic disobeyed a direct order, thinking that he allowed himself to be captured to put his plan into action. Also, her dialogue so far is… weird. I usually don't associate Sally with using this much slang, that's usually Sonic's department, and he generally keeps it to quips rather than 90s colloquialisms. Anyway, she asks to be given the skinny, as the cool kids say, and Rotor trots out a portable bot maker, basically the same sort of roboticizer that was used on Bunny. Rotor brings up the implications that, using this machine like they're planning to, might make them just as bad as Robotnik, but Sally shuts him down, basically giving the desperate times, desperate measures argument. Ooh, good thing we got those moral quandaries out of the way, just in time for Knuckles to come too. He's still reeling from the hit he took from Sonic and even ends up slamming a fist into Antoine and later Rotor. Sally manages to bring him back to reality with a quick kick to the back. Just remember kids, if somebody you know is delirious and confused due to blunt force trauma, inflicting more pain and agony on them will surely bring them around. Of course, Knuckles recognizes the feeling of her kick from when they were kids and the two of them are more than happy to see each other given their shared history, even taking a moment to reminisce as everyone else recovers nearby. Once they remember that, oh yeah, their home is basically being torn apart right now, Sally gives Knuckles the Neuro Overriders and points him to the Roboticizer. Not one for thinking, he just climbs in before she can explain the risks to him. Cut over to Knothole, where Sonic is still busy putting a dent into every single home around him, with Tails just sort of hanging out nearby. Not exactly the smartest thing he could do, especially since he's spotted by the robot not long afterwards. Tails takes off, and while Sonic stays locked onto him and prepares to fire, he hesitates, not wanting to hurt his best friend. Robotnik notices this and instead, seeing that this might be a problem, orders Mecha to give him the coordinates to Knothole so that he can personally come there and wipe it out himself. Sonic continues to resist and hesitate, even as he's forced to obey, but before he can totally screw everything… <laughs> Knuckles shows up, now in a cool new robotic body, and still fully in control of himself, smashing the radio Mecha was using to communicate with Robotnik. The two of them begin their battle anew while everyone else watches from below, commenting on how evenly matched the two fighters are, Rotor and Sally noting that the only thing in their favor right now is that the freshly roboticized Knuckles is fully healed, while Sonic still has to deal with the dents from his scuffle with Flesh and Fur, Knuckles and Bunny. And then we get a two-page spread of lasers. Ooh, ah. It's a nice image, but I'm generally against using page real estate in this manner when they could be using it to expand on the battle between them. Knuckles manages to gain a quick advantage by spinning Sonic around and plowing him into the ground, which Sonic counters by punching him so hard he's sent straight towards the nuclear warhead storage in Robotropolis. However, Knuckles reverses the magnetic polarity in his fists, attaching Sonic to him, linking the two of them together as they plummet into Robotropolis, causing a massive nuclear explosion. The others watch in horror and sadness, sure that nothing, not even the two robot warriors, would have survived the blast. Sally is especially choking up at the sight. Cut back to what's left of Robotropolis, which is looking less than stellar. However, Robotnik apparently saw them incoming and hopped down into a fallout shelter where he will inevitably re-emerge several years later in an effort to find his missing father and I'm mixing my franchises right now. 
Robotnik hears something moving in the rubble and overturns some of it to find Mecha Sonic, damaged but still repairable. But his celebrations are cut short when... Oh, you can wow, two in one issue, not bad. Knuckles uppercuts the good doctor away, stating that he survived as well, helped by Sonic apparently retaining enough of himself to turn himself toward the blast, shielding Knuckles from it enough to keep him from taking any more damage. With Robotnik knocked out, Knuckles returns with the badly damaged Sonic in tow, Sally rushing over to make sure they're both alright. Nicole says that while he's still standing, he's in almost critical a condition as Sonic, so Sally has him escorted back to the Portabot to be de-roboticized. According to Sally, it can only reverse the process on a bot that it produced, so there's the reason why they don't just use it on Bunny at least. But it also means that Sonic is a bit out of luck as well. He even states that he doesn't deserve it, showing that he was still in there somewhere and his weakened state has brought it to the front. While Sally leaves Sonic with Rotor and Nicole, urging them to find a way to save him, she and Tails see to it that Knuckles gets back to normal. They start the process, but it'll take about three minutes to happen, during which time Rotor calls her back over to have Nicole explain how they're going to save Sonic. She ties the story back in with the throwaway story where Sonic gained his billionth ring. Apparently, when he returned from that nightmare dimension, he was granted some sort of protective aura, which apparently protected his life force during the roboticization process, allowing him to keep a more firm hold on himself, and meaning that they could bring him back, whatever that means, if they had access to Rotor's lab equipment, which is currently a smoldering wreck. And even if they could salvage the parts needed, Sonic doesn't have that much time left. But before a total pity party can be thrown, Nicole literally hops back into Sally's hand, asking to try something of her own. Seeing as how they don't have any other alternatives and Sonic is fading fast, Sally allows it. Nicole links herself with Sonic via wire out of his chest, using his ring crust or something like that, or is, uh, well, she's able to de-roboticize him. Okay, confusing, but Sonic's back. And so is Knuckles, hooray! Sonic apparently doesn't remember anything that took place after he was captured by Knack, which of course leads to him getting into a pissing match with the Echidna, the result of which is Knuckles stating that Sonic is just as ungrateful as ever and that he's out of here, wanting to return to his island. Sally calls out Sonic on his behavior just in time for Antoine to slap a pair of handcuffs on him. With a tearful but firm declaration, Sonic is accused of treason and led off to be court-martialed, with a promise of a continuation of this story in issue 40. So this story should have been more epic than it was. I mean, first off, they only really use 28 or so of the 48 pages in this book to tell the story, so that's already a strike against them, but I don't know, there's just something that felt really off about it. Sally's casual danger dialogue especially. Really, the dialogue all throughout felt pretty forced, which definitely didn't help when we reached the more dramatic moments later in the comic, and while the general pace of the story was pretty good, there were a lot of coincidences used to keep it going, such as the use of the whole billionth ring protective barrier, Knuckles and Sonic pulling out new abilities and powers every time they needed to counter each other, and the color commentary of the other characters describing what's going on. It wasn't all bad though, the comic did have some very good moments. Sonic's hesitation when faced with either obliterating Tails or handing over Knothole's coordinates was quite well handled, and while the framing of Sonic is something that gets really overused in this comic, this time it was given a plausible reason, with none of the others being aware of his being captured after he stormed out of the meeting, and given his passion and lack of forethought, it's actually believable, though a little bit out there, to the point where Sally has a hard time believing it, that Sonic would actually turn himself in if he thought he could make it work. And of course, this is going to lead into issue 40, where we'll be wrapping up this particular plot thread. I also have to say I rather like the idea of Sally and Knuckles having a history together. It is more than a little out of nowhere, as it was when it was first introduced, but it does give another nice dimension to Knuckles' character beyond just being an antisocial loner. Though, I am also glad that despite the small hints dropped here, there wasn't any real attempt to create a love triangle between Sally, Sonic, and Knuckles. Pat Spaziante once again handles the pencils for the interiors, and once again he does a very good job. But you do see evidence of his more overly detailed style starting to take center stage in this issue. 
Just look at the ruined Robotropolis for an example. I mean, yeah, it is very visually interesting, but my god, is it tiring to stare at and try to soak in. Even on Mecha Sonic and Mecha Knuckles, as much as I really do like their robotic designs, there are times when it's just too much intricacy to them as well. It's visually interesting, but I don't think it works quite well when in action as it does for, say, a comic cover. That might just be personal taste, but Sonic characters tend to work their best when their designs are kept relatively simple. But on the other hand, some of the poses he pulls off in this issue are pretty damn good and fun to look at. But wait, there's more! We're just past the halfway point in terms of page count, so guess what? It's time to head into one of two backup stories in this issue. The first, starring The Chaotix, written by Kent Taylor, and with artwork done by Harvey Mercer Ducasio. And I really hope I'm pronouncing that right. And this style is certainly different from Pat's, that's for sure. We open on Charmy being swatted out of the sky by a large blue bird calling himself Predator Hawk. Just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? While Mighty is smacked away by a massive gorilla known as Sergeant Simeon. They easily put down the two Freedom Fighters, and we cut over to SBO and Vector, currently trying to figure out what is going on. Vector casually comments on the fact that things have sort of gone to hell while Knuckles was off the island, before the two of them are ambushed by another pair of attackers, Lightning Lynx and Flying Frog. The two of them are conked out without putting up much of a fight. The four of them are gathered up together, but as soon as they are, the Chaotix jump the four attackers, laying them out quickly with the element of surprise. But before they can capitalize on their advantage, they're all knocked down again by a very large, mysterious figure. Turns out to be a woolly mammoth, calling himself Mammoth Mogul. And he takes the moment to monologue to us about his backstory, because we totally need to hear all of this now instead of finding out later. He was an ordinary cave mammoth in prehistoric times. Well, normal for anthropomorphic prehistoric animals, at least. But after coming into contact with a Chaos Emerald, he was granted immense strength, intelligence, and above all, immortality, allowing him to rule over the other primitive tribes with ease until they started gaining a sense of intelligence and independence themselves. And so he has spent most of history in the shadows, secretly plotting his return to take over the world and regain his place as its ruler, now assisted by the fearsome foursome he had attacking the Chaotix earlier. The Chaotix don't take too kindly to this plan and just wail on them all for a panel, this is apparently enough for the Mammoth to think that maybe revealing himself right now isn't the best idea, and he calls in a freaking jet fighter to fire on the Chaotix while he and the Fearsome Foursome make their exit. Mogul will return when he's ready. Like he said he was just now. Hmm. Anyway, the Chaotix shout at them that they'll be waiting when he does return, and then that's it. Wow, that was, uh, underwhelming. Look, if you want to make a villain feel threatening, this isn't the way to do it. Mogul will go on to become a pretty active deuteragonist in the series, but his first appearance here definitely doesn't sell him as any sort of credible threat if one punch is enough for him to pack up shop and dash off. It's a shame too, because despite his awkward introduction and backstory here, he does have a rather interesting one. He's basically a sonic version of Vandal Savage from the DC Universe, and with similar dictatorial aspirations. But last I checked, Vandal didn't decide to abandon his plans and go into hiding because a bunch of people punched him really hard. As for the fearsome foursome introduction here, well, it's basically a good indication of just how the rest of their appearances in the comic are going to go. Hell, they're basically just hired muscle, with the only unique qualities being, again, their varied designs, but we don't even really get a good sense of what any of the members can do beyond the very basics, and they crumple just as easily as their boss does. The Chaotix, at least, get some points for being smart enough to play dead long enough to catch their enemies by surprise, but apart from Espio's disappearing act near the beginning, which doesn't even last that long, they're just there to be the Chaotix rather than Espio, Vector, Charmy, and Mighty. The story doesn't even really give us a setup for things down the line, it merely exists to introduce us to the fearsome foursome and Mogul, and it doesn't do a good job of that. In terms of art, well, it's definitely a step backwards from Pat Spaziante in my opinion. Not nearly as bad as Ken Penders, that's for sure, but everything here feels far more cartoonish than normal. Like if Sonic characters were more rubber hose characters. It's slightly off-putting, and many of the characters look like they got stung in the face and their cheeks started to swell up. Overall, this story was not very good, sorry to say. 
The entire reason it exists is to introduce a villain, but in introducing him in this manner, he does not feel threatening or like he has any real presence in the story. But we're not quite done, we've still got another backup story. This one much shorter and much goofier than the others, starring the 40 Fathom Freedom Fighters. It starts off with PB Jellyfish confronting their old foe, Octobot, who was fleeing from something. As it turns out, he was running from this charming character here, Eel Capone. God, them puns. Anyway, he threatens PB with staying off his turf and then immediately orders a bunch of hired muscles, haha, -ha, to attack PB, knocking him out completely. He comes under the care of Ray and Bivalve, who then discuss with him what to do about Eel, saying that he could be a major threat to them. I don't see how, honestly, but okay. I guess every threat should be taken seriously. However, they don't have the help of Fluke the Whale, so they can't just smush him this time. But then they are approached by a mysterious other undersea creature who plans on dealing with the eel themselves. And they start immediately, ambushing Capone and his muscles, causing all of the muscles to fall into a deep crevice at the bottom of the ocean, causing them all to get crushed by the water pressure. Well, that's dark. And then we get several panels of Bottlenose, now apparently trained as a ninja, beating up the gangster eel and allowing his capture, with the small group of freedom fighters floating off to immortalize the ninja dolphin's deeds in song at the Coral Reef, hardy har. This story is actually pretty okay. It's totally removed from any sense of continuity, stars a backup team that's only appeared a couple of times now, and apparently showed up due to high demand from fans, and is classic, punny, cartoonish Gallagher writing at its best. It's short, it's simple, it's silly, it's inoffensive and cartoonish in both its story and its art style, which oddly enough makes it a very nice follow-up to the more serious stories that came before it. It's not exactly something that'd work well on its own unless it was much earlier in the comic alongside similar silly and goofy stories, but again, it's okay. Next time, however, we're going to continue onward with the main story and get back to the fact that, oh yeah, Sonic was accused of treason when we take a look at issue 40. I'll see you all next time, everyone.